Hello. Hi, guys. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, the future of VR and the future of inputs and sensors. And uh, give me one second. My computer just totally crashed, but I'm going to be bringing it back up. Uh, all right. And uh, give us a second for the internet to buffer. And I'll try showing you guys a few VR demos today, too. But you know, VR demos on stage is a little bit of a, you know, a lot of stuff can happen. Uh, maybe I'll do it toward the end. No? OK. So I'm going to go through a lot of material really quickly. Uh, I've been talking about the future of VR for like a little while now. So, uh, but of course, uh, even though I started talking on this topic like a year or two ago, the presentation goes to like 2022. So the future is still the future. But there have been something. But some of the future has happened. So I want to update you guys a little bit as I go through that. Uh, all right. So basically, going from 2015 to 2022. Uh, with a slight disclaimer saying that if I told you guys exactly what was going to happen, I would sound crazy. So if I don't sound a little crazy, there's no chance I'm going to be right about anything. Uh, I guess my background, my background is, is that I'm the uh, co-founder and CTO at a company called Leap Motion. Uh, we make uh, next-gen hand tracking and 3D sensor type stuff. I'm going to show you a few demos of that, but uh, I don't want, the talk isn't all about that. Uh, I hope what I'm going to give you guys is a little bit of a, a taste of what's to come in the whole space. And I hope that in, in the context of what's going to happen in this space, everything that I'm doing makes sense. Uh, so cool. And uh, I've given you my disclaimer. And uh, now I'm going to plow through a few different things. So I generally, I generally split up headsets into different generations. And no one else does that. But I think that sometimes it helps kind of to break things up. So some of these you've seen by now, of course. So I'm gonna, I say, you know, this is what we have right now. This is sort of our first generation. We've got a computer. We've got a headset. We've got a camera. We've got a controller. There's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of wires. I'm surrounded by wires right now. Uh, and that's kind of where we're at. And you know, there's a lot of advantage to this. Like, the, these are all stuff that's pretty much it's either off the shelf or stuff that is directly descended from stuff that was off the shelf. Uh, this is, you know, this is potentially the, 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 I think this year and next year, potentially like the real window for these devices. Uh, after that, you'll start to see them change a lot, and I'll talk about that. Um, so, uh, I guess the biggest, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, everyone's tell you something that I was wrong about. Uh, when I first started talk, get, talking about this, I felt like, you know, these things could be pretty inexpensive, and they certainly could be. And so I wondered, you know, does that mean that someone like Amazon can make like a $99 headset? But actually, one of the things that surprised me actually is that the entire space has kind of uh, said it's just going to be expensive and deal with it, which is actually really awesome because that means that you know, uh, that's like the key to being able to have the space to innovate. Uh, and so on, on some level, I mean, we have kind of the cheap devices with, with, with sort of like a cardboard thing. We have the expensive devices. And that's actually really great. So that was, uh, uh, but on the sensor side, you know, we've still got all of our legacy stuff, keyboards, mice, wheels, joysticks. Uh, we're starting to get these hand -hold controllers, which are getting really refined, like the Move and the Hydra and the HTC Vive controllers. And, uh, and then we have these sort of various touchless motion trackers, like you know, there's us, there's the PlayStation 4i, there's the head tracker. These are all things that track stuff at a distance without touching anything. And we're one of the people who do that. But in general, that stuff is you know rapidly evolving. Uh, and uh, yeah, again, everything's off the shelf, but we're limited because everything is off the shelf. Uh, yeah. So quick context about us: uh, we make the Leap, which is a little sensor like this. You can mount it onto a headset like this, and basically, it's a little camera. Where that basic that sees uh, it's like a 135 degree field of view, which is slightly bigger than the headset. So because it's on your face, it sees everything that you would see. So basically, whatever you see, it tracks. So if you see your hands, you know you see and it tracks your hands. And then if you interact with an object that you can see, you can also interact with it with your hands, and that's pretty awesome. And basically, that allows you to have very physical, nuanced uh, interactions. And uh, what, is, what, do you need to do, what, do you, what do you need to have to do this? You need, again, you need the really wide field of view. You need high frame rates. You need something called skeletal tracking for the hands, which means that I don't just tell you if I see a finger or not. I tell you if that's a left hand or a right hand. And where, where all the fingers are doing, is that a thumb, is that a finger? You kind of need to be able to know everything, even if it's not obvious, uh, because it makes it much easier to program for. Uh, so right now, it's like 120 frames a second, 8 milliseconds of uh, video latency, like 4 milliseconds for the tracking, and like this huge field of view. And this is with the device that you can buy uh, right now. So a lot of people are buying this, messing around with this, and they can kind of try to experiment with this sort of next generation of uh, things. And, uh, and then you might be wondering, like, OK, so th um, this sensor we made wasn't originally for VR. What does a VR sensor look like? 
so this was a VR sensor we were talking about a while back, which is this uh, called the Dragonfly sensor. So it's basically, it's, it's not just uh, infrared, it's red, green, blue, and infrared. So it gives you color and infrared and motion tracking. And so you can basically see through the headset. And uh, that's really interesting if you want to like, you know, do augmented reality, mixed reality, or just go back and forth in the real world and the, and the digital world without having to take the headset off. Um, but uh, uh, actually, I'm going to pause for a second and go back to a demo because now I'm getting a little far ahead. But uh, basically, uh, actually, I'm going to go back to a demo for a second. So this is, sorry, guys. I'm jumping too far ahead. Uh, so let me just show you some real quick example of something. Uh, I'm going to unplug a few things, plug a few things. Um, and then I'm going to put on my virtual, virtual reality headset. Uh, and uh, so just so I can see everyone, I'll put the headset on later. Uh, and so basically, this just has the leap on it, it has a mount on it. And uh, here we go. Oops, one second. The demos are going to be the spot where it takes me a minute to jump around. Before I go too crazy about sensors and different types of sensors, I feel like it's important to get to show you guys just like some kind of baseline. Uh, all right. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. All right. So uh, what you basically see here are two images. And so you can see a picture of me. And there's actually two little sensors. There's a sensor here, and there's a sensor here. And so it's just an infrared camera. So it's kind of you know Blair Witch. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that was infrared. But if I see my hand now, then basically I can track, I can track a 3D model of my hand on top of that. And so uh, this means that when you're in virtual reality and you see your hands, you basically have these virtual hands that you can manipulate objects with, as you were seeing earlier. And when I said skeletal tracking, what that means is that like, I'm not just tracking the fingertips, but I track the entire skeleton. So even if I do something like this, you can still see the fingers behind my hand. Or if I do something like this, and the thumb goes behind my hand, we still report that out. Because in this case, you know, it's not just important for visuals. This thumb going right behind my hand here can mean the difference between picking up an object and not picking up an object, so it's really important. Uh, so basically, that allows you to do all that. And uh, so, yeah, so I mean, it's uh, very high accuracy, very high frame rate, uh, very smooth, very accurate. That's what we do. Uh, I'm going to show you guys a few more things as we go along. But uh, now, back to my talk. Uh, so this, this sensor, so you see there's cameras and there's infrared, and you're like, okay, let's make that color, and that sounds right. And, we, and we, let's put it, pass it through, and we can see the headset. And that actually turned out to be pretty cool. And, uh, one of the things that we ended up finding, though, was that uh, this, this camera is not actually in your eyeballs. So if I look, around, look through this camera and I look through these eyeballs, so basically if I look through this camera with the color and then I look through my eyeballs in virtual reality, the eyeball, I have two sets of eyeballs in two different places, so they don't quite match up perfectly. It can be okay, but a lot of people want it to, you know, want it to match up better. So uh, although a lot of people are looking at these sort of uh, color sensors, what we're often doing is we're starting to reconstruct the room, like slam style. So basically, you build a model of the 3D room, and then you reproject it back into the headset, and, uh, and then you show that instead. Uh, so that was something that I was uh, just kind of a new thing. And then with the hands, we can do something similar. So this is a, I give it a second. So like, so instead, so I had an image of my hand, right? Maybe I want to show a, something that looks like an image of my hand in virtual reality, but I want it from the perspective of my eyeballs. So then what we do is something like this. Give it a second. It's a gif. It's a gif. Here we go. So you see, it's kind of this fat hand. It's like an inflated tracked hand. So I have a tracked hand. I inflate it like a balloon. And then I overlay the image onto it. You see that? You see it's a little bit. You still see the inflated balloon. And now I'm going to remove the inflated balloon. See, it's gone now. And now I'm going to add in a little glow. And then I'm going to add in another glow on top of that. And now I'm basically using the fake depth map from a 3D tracked hand to then allow you to intersect the virtual object. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that might be a bit much. So let me like go back for one second. Maybe just I don't know, I'm going to go between tech and future. So if everybody wants more future, less tech, more tech, less future, like you know, just scream. <laughs> uh, but okay. So let me just show you one second. Uh, da -da -da, da -da -da. Now we're going to the Oculus. Dangerous. Uh, right and. So one of these things that we've been experimenting with is actually having images of your hands instead of virtual hands. And uh, so let's see if I can show you what this looks like. I've actually, so some of these demos no one has seen before. So it uh, could be cool. All right, so I am in virtual reality, and I have hands. But I have these image hands, right? 
But from my perspective, these are actually at the right depth and these are actually at the right scale and it's all with the virtual cameras. And just to give you an understanding of how that works, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do something crazy, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at my hand and then I'm going to separate my head from my head. So now I'm looking around, like I'm looking away from my head. So what you can see here is that there is a hand, from my perspective it looks good, but as you go around it you see it's not really like a 3D model, it is a 3D model, so it's a 3D model merged with the images from the camera, you know what I mean? So that's kind of awesome, I don't know, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, actually here let me do it one more time, uh, try to do something weirder. Yeah this is, so like something like this where there's a lot of depth. So you can do a lot of these illusions with these sensors which is that like if everything's from just the right angle you can't tell. But then of course, you know, it's in reality, it's kind of a total, it's, I don't want to say hack, but it's, it's an illusion. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, unfortunately I can't go all the way around. Maybe I can? No, I can't. I don't have a back LED. But yeah, anyway, quick demo. Uh, all right, so projecting things into virtual reality. Uh, that's pretty cool. So that, you know, whenever you want to use mixed realities, you, in virtual reality you have to reproject them back in. All right, so that's kind of stuff right now. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit forward now. So from generation one, we usually have all this stuff. Generation two, we usually have less. So you guys have seen this too. But going from this to this, like where did the computer go? Like it's kind of a big deal and I want to just go back and forth for a second. Uh, and so what I call generation two is these, these are untethered, they're single device products. I can actually hold something in my hand and say this is a VR product, which isn't really that, it wasn't true in the past. Uh, you know, most of these are phone based and there's a lot of problems with that. Like, uh, I, I used to think when I first started giving this presentation that this is going to be like a huge generation, but what it looks like is that in order to make these, like, at some point you want to make the phones into VR headsets, but then every phone you sell is basically a VR headset and you're taking all this extra cost. And so as a phone maker, you usually don't really want to do that. So you're kind of always holding back from making it as good as you could for virtual reality, just because you can't, you know, you're shipping hundreds of millions or tens of millions, it's a big deal to add like $10 to these things. Uh, so I think in some way, although we can do really cool stuff with this right now, it's always going to be a little limited, but uh, there's one thing that's maybe a little bit of a wild card here that I didn't see before, which was like stereo cameras. So uh, a lot of the next generation phones are going to go from one camera to two cameras on the back. And the reason why you do that is because you want a bigger camera so you see better low light, but you can't make it bigger without making the lens bigger so then you get this lens sticking out the back. So what, what you do instead is you kind of, you chop the camera in half, you put two little lenses on and it's all thinner. So basically a lot of these cameras are gonna have, a lot of these things are gonna have these stereo cameras and this is much, much better for like computer vision, virtual reality for example, than like an existing one would be. Uh, I guess why is the rear view camera bad? Well the rear view camera is basically this little green box and then this thing is like your actual field of view. So it's, not, it's no good. Uh, lots of other things aren't good too, but uh, we can overcome some, we can't overcall all of them, but we basically uh, quickly run to the next generation. But just to kind of, uh, before we go to the next generation really fast, uh, inputs change a lot. So in the past with PCs, I can use a joystick, I can use a keyboard, I can use a mouse, I can use my wheel, those are all great things. But if I have a Gear VR in my backpack, I'm not gonna bring a steering wheel with me. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I could, but you know, it's a big commitment. And uh, I mean, actually the other one is, or like maybe I take it on the airplane, I'm, unfortunately I'm not gonna look like this on the airplane. And I mean, I love this stuff, so I don't wanna make fun of it, but at the same time, like, I can't bring this on an airplane. Uh, so you really need a different type of interface, and uh, I guess, you know, n not, not to tout the lead motion too much, but you bring your hands everywhere you go, and so that's kind of cool, just, just by coincidence. And, uh, and so there's something about, uh, you know, the sort of universal human interface uh, that actually becomes really, really compelling, like becomes extra compelling with these mobile devices. And uh, uh, let's see, uh, I guess one of the other, I'm gonna, one of the other interesting things is of course, as you have more of these sensors on here, you can start doing, you, you, can, you, can, you can add an extra camera, uh, actually more of a sensor. Uh, so I used to think this was gonna be a generation two thing where we, you know, we can do eye tracking, hand tracking, body tracking, head tracking, object tracking, mouth tracking, environment tracking, voice recognition, all these are things that these should do, but because we don't wanna add cost to the phone and because USB is fundamentally such a limit right now, and we do have something called MIPI so we could go around USB, but again, we don't wanna change the, we don't wanna make the phones not a phone, so uh, a lot of these stuff gets pushed to the next generation. Uh, which I'm just gonna, which I'm gonna call generation three. And so generation three, some people are, I, I calling it generation three, some people are actually starting to call them like all-in-one VR products. I guess there's like an all-in-one computer. So the idea is just everything's in the headset, it's built for VR from the ground up. Uh, it's got some phone parts in it, but for the most part, uh, it's a totally new product. And uh, some of these I think will look maybe similar to the Gear VR today, but a lot of these, because you, you, you really, 
you know, you, you really had time to say, I don't want this to be a phone, like I'm willing to pay more money. And right now the whole space is trending towards more money, which is great, uh, which basically means I can build so that looks totally different than what we see today. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of what a Generation 3 headset might look like. These are like public and on the internet, but so like I'm not breaking NDAs, but everything that I really love, I can't show you, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, so this is a cool one, it's called a fiber optic collimator OLED headset. So basically there's this little fiber optic, this is a curved sheet of fiber optics and it basically makes the flat screen look like a curved screen and if it's a curved screen it's easier to do with optics. So you can basically make a headset that's really small. So that's pretty cool. But it's got no phone parts in it. Uh, and, you know, it's not using a phone screen anymore. Uh, and so that's, 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 you know, that's not like anything we've seen today. Uh, and here's another one that's really cool. So this is a holographic OLED display. So you have these, uh, these little OLEDs are embedded in the plastic substrate. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit. And they point out and then they bounce off the holographic substrate and then back into your eyeball and you basically, and everything else is transparent. And so when we get to something like this, like this really doesn't look like a, a, what a, a VR headset anymore, but I mean actually this is an AR headset. But I mean fundamentally you have to think when, when I've made, a, as a headset maker, once I've made the commitment to break away from existing technologies, there's no reason why screens need to be opaque. There's just, there's no reason. Like the only reason why screens are opaque is because no one wants to pay for a transparent phone. Uh, I don't know, maybe one day. Uh, and uh, all right, so now is this, so we're looking at this transparent pair of glasses. This is pretty nuts looking. Uh, where's the camera go? So like we want to put cameras in here. We want to be able to put sensors in here. Uh, can we do that? And the answer is yes. Uh, so this is something that's called a wafer level camera. So it's like basically it's a little sensor and little, little optics and you squish them all together. There's different wafers in them and you get a little camera the size of this pencil tip. And, uh, and they get smaller than this too. So you can basically make cameras any size. Yeah, I didn't know that either originally. Uh, and uh, so when you see a sensor like this, if you can imagine a sensor like this tracking hands, tracking objects, tracking like your mouth and whatever, like you realize, and you, you realize that like we're making these things really small, really cheap. We're gonna put like processing power on board so they can do their own tracking without having to go to like an arm chip. And then you realize like I basically just made these cheap tiny sensors that I can put anywhere. Like they don't just have to go on your head anymore. Like I can put them in light bulbs and I can put them, I can put them in my, I, you know, I can put them in my uh, toaster, I don't know. But like the idea is these things basically cost nothing and they're zero size and they have all the intelligence built into them and so that's a really powerful thing that's going to affect things outside of the space. But I don't know, in general, pretty exciting pretty small, like three by three by three millimeters. So that's the kind of stuff that we'll see. Uh, I guess uh, here's another one I like to show, which is like, you know, I can, you can, so I showed you the current sensors has like two cameras facing forward, but you can have cameras sort of pointing everywhere. Some can point down, some can point sideways, some can point up. You can have like an extremely wide, you can have an almost 360 degree field of view that way. Uh, the ones pointing down can see your mouth and your feet too. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but things are gonna get crazy. Uh, things have already kind of gotten crazy, actually. So when I first showed this, everyone's like, what? And then this happened a few months later. It's like, okay, yeah. So, you know, we already have a lot of products out there that are starting to do this, where you just you code it with cameras. And there's no reason why you can't do that. The cameras don't actually cost a lot of money. Uh, the, uh, and then, of course, uh, people are like mouth tracking. And then, you know, we did one of these, which is, you know, we didn't do it, but, you know, the researchers did one of these, which was a face track, a mouth tracking thing on an Oculus headset. Obviously, you don't need to have the uh, uh, deep sea fish thing going. Like it could just, you could just put it on the bottom of the headset looking down at your mouth, but uh, they couldn't with this sensor, so, you know, that's what they did. Uh, you get you know, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the processing for these things start, like, you know, head, with head tracking and mouth tracking and position tracking and all that, so you start pulling those out to other sensors, like, to, sorry, to other types of chips. Like, uh, uh, like uh, here's, here's a cool one. So I'm just going through lots of technology really fast. So uh, suppose I want to, like, track hands or I want to like track my ob track objects or I track the room like at some point I actually just build a special processor for that and they're making these now uh, not really anybody can buy them but they're there you know so this is an example of one this one's like a it's hard to see but these little squares they're all processors and so this is a little processor that's next to a quarter and it's got 12 processors in it and each of those processors is about as fast as your smartphone would be uh, for something like object tracking because there's like just made for that and so that's pretty crazy. So you get these little tiny chips that are just like, they're just made for just this only like three, only kind of sensing and sensor stuff. So you, you know, again, you, you often wonder like, why aren't, you know, why aren't things, fa why aren't like, you know, X faster, why isn't Y better at X? And usually the answer is there's no reason, just no one wanted to make a Y for X. So the second you do that, it's, it's actually makes things a lot easier. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm blitzing crazy fast here and I wanna give some people time for questions. I'm gonna keep going for a little bit longer. Uh, 
So I kind of just talked about three generations, and probably people didn't notice because I was going so fast, but like I gave dates for each one of them. And each of them kind of happened within one year of the other, which is kind of insane, but we're actually kind of getting there. So you're gonna actually, so like, I guess we're about halfway through right now, so we're gonna start seeing a lot of these generation three ones soon, and it's crazy that we're just going through this just like, like that, like lightning, it's just, it's, it's totally crazy. And what we realize, what we're really doing is we're bringing like the, the ubiquity and portability and all of the technology of the mobile era, and we're basically merging that with the most immersive technology we can make, and then we're just smashing it onto our faces, which is kind of crazy and dangerous, and, but it's cool. There's a lot of things that can come out of it, and I think it'll be worth it. Uh, and uh, I guess another thing I, I kind of skimmed over was like, I think I said 20, 20 like, like the generation three, I said like 2016 to 2022, I was supposed to say, and that's like a really long time. So people are like, what happened? Like, you know, everything else is one year. Why does this thing take four years? So I'm just gonna go further into the future for a second in case things aren't scary enough. Uh, so we have these transparent displays right now, and they're all additive. And so you start, you know, the, you, and uh, so actually, sorry, I should say, we have transparency right now, but they're uniform transparency. And so what we'll eventually start getting is we'll get variable uniform transparency. So that means I could have a transparent headset that goes to opaque. So you can imagine if I had a, you know, if a HoloLens went opaque, it'd basically be a VR headset. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, and then you go from uniform transparency to local transparency. So I can start actually like taking individual pixels and saying you're opaque, you're opaque, you're opaque. And what that lets me do is that lets me block things out in the real world and overlay things on top of that which is kind of awesome because uh, otherwise the screen is only additive, so if I put something in front of me, you can kind of still see through it. Uh, a lot of the headsets, you know, the non-transparent ones too, right now they're all sort of fixed focus, or you can, you know, you can change it with like one knob, but then they'll become variable focused, so the idea is something close to you or far away from you, it changes the focus in real time. Uh, some of them will be single focus plane, which means they only have one focus. Some will be variable focus which, uh, with multiple focal plane, uh, planes. So the idea is you can, you can have like an object here and an object here, and then you have to actually have to focus at one or focus at the other, and it's really cool. Uh, a lot of this stuff actually exists at prototype levels, but I can't name names. Uh, a lot of, there's right now, there's, there's, a, there's emissive displays. So most of our VR headsets everyone's seen are kind of emissive. It's like I have a screen that's emitting light. But then a lot of these things are gonna to go to like retinal projection, which means I'm just gonna like shoot a laser beam directly into your eyeball and like draw an image there, which sounds really scary, but you can try it. They had one at CES, it's super cool. Uh, it's not as scary as it sounds. I can go more to that if someone wants to. Uh, and you know, the sensors, sensors go nuts. We go from like infrared to millimeter wave and ultrasound, and we use laser rays, electric fields, phased array, you know, radio stuff. Uh, you can, you, can make like, you can make like ultrasonic 3D sensors. There's these things called stack image sensors, compressive sensing. There's frameless cameras and lensless cameras too, if it doesn't sound weird enough. Uh, so here's, like an, here's a laser array. These are really cool. Uh, this is a stack sensor. So the idea is you stack chips on top of each other. So the idea is like every pixel has its own brain, and so you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Like the idea is you don't have to take the image and then go out to a processor. Every pixel already has its own. So that's crazy. Uh, we get, this is a, so this is, this is the wafer level module. This is, the, this is the, the small sensor I showed you before. But you know, the, if you actually look at this, like most of it is lens, that's why it's thick. And so if I use a lensless sensor, because that's awesome, uh, it goes from this to this. So this is actually, I couldn't even, this is, this is not my photo, but that, that, that little thing on the O, that's the sensor now. With, it just doesn't need a lens, because you know, why would I need a lens for a sensor? They, have, they use a mask and it's computational imagery. I can explain if anybody wants to, but I'm just plowing through the future right now. Uh, and then you can imagine putting a processor on something like this, and you, now this is like a sensor and a processor with several chips down, and uh, now we're, you know, people start calling things like smart dust, like these are millimeter size, like I could, I could just go and with like a hundred of them, it's crazy. And if you put power sources on them and they're wirelessly powered, you know, scary. Uh, and uh, what about the headsets? You know, the headsets are basically, you're gonna, it's gonna be weird, I, I, I'm, it's gonna, I, I call it like pay more to wear less, because basically, if you buy your, if you buy like the lowest level headset, you might have like a headset and like a battery pack and like a wire coming down, and oh, that sucks, one wire. Uh, and so, but you can imagine if you want to pay, you know, extra, maybe they use a metal air battery and like super capacitors and you know non silica like germa a gallium or graphene processors and all sorts of crazy stuff so that you don't need to carry around that oppressive battery pack. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, you got to look hip. And uh, <laughs> I'm speaking. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but you know, lots of technology, and now I'm going to go from technology to like maybe what this means. So 
uh, what I usually say is like the material of the world, like what we're, like this is just the next few years, the materials, like the fundamental materials that the world is made of is gonna change. You know, right now we live in a world of like atoms and electrons, but soon it's like, and like in plastic and wood, which, you know, which basically creates like plastic, wood, and metal, but we're going to like this new material called like digital stuff. And instead of made of atoms, it's made of like bits and bytes. And it'll just be this other layer of the world. And you know, atoms behave this way, and bit, th th things made of atoms behave this way, and things made of bits and bytes behave that way. And people who grew up in this world, that'll just be like a natural distinction, which is a little cool. Uh, the human, like, and of course we have all these sensors, so like, I was just talking about like tiny sensors, like smart dust, you have light bulb set, like, th like sensors everywhere. So as a person now with one of these headsets on, I don't just have to see things in front of me, I can also kind of disembody and see things around me. Like this, roof, this wall could be transparent if the sensor's on the other side of the wall. I could, you know, be up in the sky and check out the traffic. So, in, you know, the hu I can, you know, if I have sensors on the back, on the sides, I can start to seeing behind me. Like human senses as a whole start expanding in really crazy ways. You know, even if this is an infrared sensor, and if I put this on a headset and a kid has it, he now has night vision goggles. Well, that's like, that's like the tamest thing. And so like, let alone when you're using ultrasonic phased array laser stuff, like you can see through, you know, it's all cool. Uh, and you know, there's, you know, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, I mean, maybe we won't all have to deal with it. Maybe I'll be old by then, but the, uh, the kids are gonna get weird, I like to say. So uh, as, a, as a kid growing up in this world, like, I, I actually, as, 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 like an, as, like an, as like an old guy, I guess, like right now, I, t seeing something means it's there. You know, and seeing something it means something to me because I grew up seeing with seeing and hearing. Like, hear, like hearing means sounds, seeing means some kind of object. But as these kids grow up with all of these sort of outputs and inputs that are that are actually digital, sight sight doesn't have to be sight. Sound doesn't have to be sound. I can start to remap these things, and I can I can look at something like it's physically there, or I can look at something like it's a completely different mapping of reality. And so that's 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 nuts. Uh, and uh, but I mean I, I like to say that they're going to be cool though. Because like the kids, they're not just going to grow up playing with soccer balls now. Like a kid who plays a play, with, playing with a soccer ball, he has some like intuition for how physics works. But like physics at our scale, like Newtonian physics. But then as I used to study physics, and you go from Newtonian physics, like oh I get everything to quantum physics, it's like help me. And and so, but you know, kids in the future, they won't play, they won't just play, you know, they just won't grow up with soccer balls. They'll grow up with you know playing with quantum particles and galaxies because you can do that. It's just digital stuff, and it's at my scale, and I can interact with it, and I can build a mental model of it. So if somebody says if a galaxy here hits a galaxy here, what does it do? I'm like, oh, I know what that does. It's just the stars go this way, and this thing goes this way, and it's just a normal, natural thing because I've played with galaxies before. I don't know about you. Uh, so that's like an expanded human experience, and that's pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, and I like to say, the way that we fundamentally approach problems is just completely changed. You know, like, uh, if I want to understand physics, I, I, again, as a physics student, I was, always, I was often very frustrated. Like, you know, this is, a, this is an equation of gravity. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Like, and so, like, you can, and so it's very hard to, like, build, like, even if you play with gravity models, which I guess I've happened to do, I used to work at NASA, it's like you don't really have an intuition for, like, why does gravity behave that way? But if you actually have, like, um, real access to the guts, you're like a digital creator. You don't have to just play with gravity and galaxies. You can play with, like, what if gravity was different in, like, in this way or different in this way? It was like, if it was negative or positive, or instead of one over r squared, it's one over r to the 1.5th power. And like, you realize that you, you don't have to just, you don't have to under, you don't, you don't just get to understand the world beyond human scale or below human scale, but you get to understand the world, like the, like the, like the, ba the, the math that's, un that's deeper than that. Like, how should I say? Uh, basically, when you start to separate the, if you start to, this is now an experience thing, so like if you start to play with gravity simulations and you change gravity back and forth with, to different rules, you start to realize, oh, gravity is like, gravity behaves this way because it's just, there's a spectrum of possible mathematical forces. There's like red and there's blue and greens between red and blue and it all makes sense. So the idea is you can actually understand the world at a deeper level, which is like beyond reality because you have the ability to change it and that's really, really interesting. And, uh, I like to say the, uh, you know, a lot, of the in a lot of the intelligence that we apply to problem solving today, I, I, it's like abstract intelligence. So like, you know, if I'm, uh, if, if, I, if I'm, because it's technology, if I want to work on the brain, I can't be like Jane Goodall because even though Jane, you know, brilliant scientist, working on the brain is so abstract. It's all like, it's all, it's like, it, I can't, I can't really feel it. I can't really explore it. It's this like, it's, 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 just, it's, a, it's like a mathematical abstract computational model. 
but you realize you, somebody who has that intelligence, you can now put them in the brain, let them explore, try the models out, change things, and all of a sudden you have this base, you know, what I call physical, intuitive, social, emotional intelligence. Most of human intelligence is actually now able to be applied to real problems, which I think is a really big deal too. And, uh, and I guess this all probably sounds pretty magical, but you know, uh, R.C. Klotgen, any sufficiently advanced technology, indistinguishable from magic, so we're heading towards a pretty magical place. And I like to say, won't that be fun? And uh, yeah, and so I, I'll stop for a minute and I'll just take some questions. Thanks. And uh, I can show some more demos if some people decide more demos, but it depends too. So we'll see what people want. Uh, anybody, people? What's up? Yeah, so there's no reason why you can't do positional tracking with these sensors. We don't right now. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people look at that kind of thing. I think that you'll have a set of sensors that do positional tracking and all sorts of tracking, and they'll all be one thing. Uh, but right now, we try to focus on hands. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. So I just showed you guys something that technically isn't released yet, but it will be released in the near future. So it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a little tricky. Like, it, it looks really good. It's harder to do intersections really well with it bec uh, for various reasons uh, with some of the new code, but. What's that? Uh, so, what we're doing is, is we have a 3D model of the hand and then we project the images onto it. And so, it's. Uh, yeah, so it basically, I think it comes down, we, there, there's a few versions of it that are weird in different ways. So there's one where it just projects onto the model, and there's one where we create like a mesh that's like half image processing, half hand model, half, you know, pixels. And so I think the most advanced thing right now uh, doesn't entirely, is, is not as simple as the one I described, but we want to release this stuff, so we're going to release it soon. But it's, uh, I technically just showed you something that isn't released. Yeah. Uh, anyone? Uh, Yeah, I, I, we, we can do that. Uh, yeah, I, I have, I, it should be similar to what's online, but I, I need to fix. There's a lot of typos. All right, I'll put it up. Cool. Uh, we really want to know curious about the detail of the suggestion that you can kind of feel like I'm going to touch my, my ring finger to my thumb and if I break back that, it's going to suggest that you're going to hit on something. Yeah, I totally skipped a part of my presentation, which I shouldn't have, and now you're asking about, which is great. Uh, I often like to talk about these things called virtual wearable interfaces. So the idea is you can kind of attach interfaces to the hands. Uh, and you go like, push it, push it, push it. Uh, and so there's a bunch of different types of ways of doing this. Here's another one that's really cool. So you kind of have a thing that comes out of your arm. Give it a second. Ooh, bam. And you kind of move things around. I have more demos of these two I can show. But one of the things that I hope to, is that we're going to have these sort of multi-level interfaces. So you have these virtual wearable interfaces that kind of are like hand to hand, hand to arm. They're always with you. And then you know another interface beyond that, sort of like a more of a launcher type of interface, like something that's more complicated, not instantaneous. And then something beyond that, which is more of like an environment which you'd have like more complicated, like I want to I wanna schedule a meeting with, with Lucy or something. Uh, sorry, did that answer your question? Yeah, so um, they're def it works pretty good. It's, 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 it's about as good as you, it's about as good, it's, it's probably a bit better than you, than you would imagine it could be, but it's not, it's not better than that, uh, in that like, uh, it's, so if you're looking at it, it's very easy. If you're not looking at it, we can often get it, but it won't always get it. So you'll generally build the interfaces so that like, you know, I'm looking at my palm while I do these things. And you have to be really careful how you do these anyway, because like, if, if you're not, like, I just have all this uh, stuff on my hands all the time, and I can't get it off. So like, that's, that's, the challenge is usually not designing the interfaces, but designing interfaces that kind of are there when you want them and not there when you don't, and just very unintrusive inside the experience. Uh, but I, I, what's it? Yeah. Is 
Yeah. I don't know if security ever keeps pace. On some level, it's about the illusion of security, not to be too grim, but uh, I don't know. Uh, my favorite thing was there's a sci-fi author, Charles Strauss, where somebody has an AR headset, and he's like a scientist, and he's kind of zone, he's kind of spacey, and someone steals it from him, and, and the crook puts it on, and the headset is so commanding, he then goes to the scientist's meeting and does the meeting for him. So I, I don't know what to say, but I mean, even, even no matter how your security is, someone could just, I mean, I guess you could have eye scanning and you could retinal stuff, and I don't know. It, I'm sure it'll get good eventually, but I feel always security is still behind. I'm not a security expert, but historically that's where it's been, I feel like. Um, yeah, the biggest challenge, I think, is when you bring all these different interface modalities together, like eye tracking and hand tracking and voice tracking and mouth tracking and body tracking, and like how do you build computing around that? Uh, it's, not that it's not that it's hard. I wouldn't say it's not that it's not something that we can't do. It's just it's so different from anything we've ever had before. It's like you want to usually make physical interfaces, not abstract interfaces. And even just that step is like kind of unintuitive. And a lot of this design also, I think, is. Uh, the biggest thing I usually see designers mess up on is that they, they take a graphic design approach to what's really more of an industrial design and architecture problem. So it is, you're not just, you're not, you're not building, you're not building a, you're not making a graphic design poster, you're making like, you're making an object or you're making a space and these are like real, in some ways they're real things even though they're not. And so that, those, it, there's a lot of challenges but they're all overcomable. It's, it's mostly a human. I think the, the progress is going to be more limited by humans than by technology. So it's like how fast we can, how fast we can expand our minds and experiment and figure things out. Uh, I think I missed a person over there. Let's get the person over there. Yeah, so there's kind of three kinds of haptic, four kinds of haptics. There's like, I, I have my hand and, it touch, and I do this and I, like, I feel my own hand or I touch my hand to a hand. So that's like, that's the best because it's not just, not just do I do it, not just do I feel things, but I also have proprioception. So I know where my hands are without looking at them, you know, which is I don't get for the table. Uh, but then there's also like, I touch the table, that's another type of haptics. So like, you know, we could of course, we could map things onto, you could map things onto surfaces or objects or laps or whatever. Uh, there's also, um, then there is sort of the, you touch a virtual object, and if you do it just right, you kind of feel it even though it isn't there. It's like phantom limb syndrome. Uh, then there's things like uh, phased array ultrasound, which allows you to beam form ultrasonic waves, and it kind of, you focus it on the person's hand, it flicks and you can feel it, which is totally weird. There's a company called Ultra Haptics that's working on that right now out of Britain, they're super cool. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the haptics that we will never get, probably, which is like texture, because texture is usually, like really fine texture, because it's usually nanometer scale and nothing can really simulate that well right now. And then there's like force, which is like I push against the virtual wall and it holds me back, which the only way we're probably gonna get that is if we have exoskeletons on. And if you want that for your fingers, your fingers need exoskeletons too, which somebody made them. It's, it's super cool, but like, you know, you, you, might, you could have an exoskeleton at your house, but you probably won't be walking around with one. Maybe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's, so, we'll be, there's a lot that we'll get and there's a lot that we won't get. And the things that I'm more, the, the things with a lot of force are kind of, uh, I'm actually kind of thankful that we won't get, because if, if I could like use ultrasound to make me run to a brick wall, that'd be pretty scary. Uh, anyone else? Person in the back. Um, how do you see your hand tracking in the near future working with or not working with, uh, like, the, 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 the Oh, thank you for asking that. That's a super good question. So we like to say, you know, like sometimes you're, you're going to have controllers, and I don't think of them as controllers. I think of them as tools. Like when you use a controller, you're using it with your hand, and you know hands are sort of this more universal interface. But but controllers and tools are specialized interfaces. So like another example would be like a stylus versus a touchscreen. Like a stylus is just going to be better than using your fingers for a lot of things. Uh, but you know I don't. I mean I'd always have the stylus with me. It's a special tool for a special action. You know or like a hammer. And so I definitely think these controllers are going to be tools. But I think that you know. Uh, for their, and they're going to be really good for specific things, but I don't necessarily think any of them have the universality of hands or the sort of ubiquity of hands. But uh, even just there's like there's things that are like kind of philosophical like that, and then there's even just simple things like uh, I was using a controller recently in VR and I was trying to find the A button and I couldn't find it because I couldn't see my fingers. And so even just merging the two together so I can like tell where the buttons are and where my thumb is that'd be pretty that'd be nice that would that would be nice in some demos. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for merging things together, even if it's just like, oh, there's a controller there, now here's my hand, and now I grab the controller, I still have it in my hand, and you know, stuff like that. But 
Uh, again, long term, you get to mobile, and I just, uh, it's hard to carry these around with you. And I like to think there's going to be a lot of really interesting things we'll be able to do with all of our fingers and digits and f things like that. Uh, we'll probably show some more soon. Uh, any other questions? Questions, questions? Yes. Oh, yes. So I guess I should talk about the things uh, that we have. Uh, so our stuff works on Mac, Linux, Windows. There is an Android alpha. Uh, this S SDK supports almost every language I can think of. So like Objective-C, C++, Unity, Unreal, uh, Java, Python, Ruby, I think, JavaScript, everything. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, it's a lot of work. Pat our guys in the back. What's up? Uh, the, U the UIs or what? Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's pretty good. It's pretty good already. I mean, uh, but I think you'll see. You know, we 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 do a lot of software updates. So you're going to continue. You're going to see more and more software from us that makes it all easier to make and even more reliable. And it's just it's going. It's it's going to it's going to increase really fast. So like, I think. Uh, I think this software version, it was like 90%, and then the next software version is like 98%. So you're going to see a lot of jumps. The last few percent was a pain, but we spent like eight months user testing recently, just like making people push buttons over and over again, even when they weren't totally sober, until we got it down. And uh, so I think we got it down. But can you type on it? That's an interesting question. Yes, you can type on it. There, um, it's, it's, I think you'll want a smart keyboard at the end of the day. Like, uh, because even for a phone, I want a smart keyboard. So I haven't seen I haven't seen the virtual reality smart keyboard with hands that I dream of, but I have seen hints of it. So like there is a, a group of students from the Tsinghua University, and they made a really cool machine learning gesture control keyboard with a leap. Unfortunately, it was for PCs and not for VR. But we will see it. I think we can see more like that soon. Now there's a paper on it. Uh, anyone else? Questions? Questions? This demo is made in Unity. Almost every demo is made in Unity. Yes, go with Unity. Uh, so yeah, every, everything is made in Unity. Unity is the easiest thing right now to make this stuff in, uh, by far. So you know, Unity is kind of like the, the medium of virtual reality right now. Uh, any other questions? Yes. All right. Mm, all right. Well, all right. I'll, let's see if I can end on a demo. This is the demo that froze my computer while I was standing up here, so it may do so again, but let's, this is the end, right? So let's do this. We'll do it live. All right. Uh, give me a second. Hopefully not too many. All right, I am here. Everything is a go. Let's load it up. So this would be, if this demo works, this would be another thing that no one's seen, and that will not be available yet. But uh, this is some wearable interface stuff. So give, again, no guarantees. VR demos on stage are scary. All right. Everyone hopefully sees me. I have hands, right? So I'm, this is my fake virtual reality application. I guess I'm pushing stuff around. And uh, if I look at my arm now, I see, hey, look, I've got, my, I've got some messages. I've got some emails. And then I want to do this. And yeah. And so. Now I wanna I wanna check my message. I'm gonna push this. I'm like I don't I don't like Amy. I don't like John. I don't like David. Oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, and let me check my emails. There's some emails there. And you know I scroll a little bit and we can check that off and get that off. And all right, you know now I want to like open up some mail. So I'm gonna push this thing. So now I've got my little. This is all my little application. So I'm like uh, I want to go to Gmail. And now I'm gonna go to Gmail again. And, and now I'm in my application uh, messages. It's not really a real re strong reason for this. This is just a mock up. And if, and then if I wanted to, I go, and I've got back in my back in my space. So that was really cool. And then if I want, I can also say like, uh, all right, let's see. Uh, da -da 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 -da. And then I'm gonna go back again. I'm like, okay, now I want to like do something complicated. So I'm gonna leave this space. So I'm still in the application right now, but now I want to like I have to leave it because I need to invite Mary to a to a phone call or something. So I push this button down here, and then I'm now like in my space. And you know, there's much more complicated interfaces, and there's a cat there for some reason, and stuff like that. And, uh, and now this is, like, this is like my studio. So this is like where I get serious stuff done with furniture and cats. 
Uh, so yeah, sort of a much more complicated interface. We're going to see a lot of stuff like this. Just you know, it's 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 all natural when you have hands to build up these layers of complexity to be able to seamlessly be in a world and then to check the time and then to check your email and then to go back out to another application and then to go back to your room. Like those sorts of interactions just should be easy and natural and like no big deal. And I think they will be. And uh, you know, uh, right now is the time to to I guess figure it out and get it done. And uh, thanks, guys.